Hey everybody, I'm here today to talk about Emacs and specifically Emacs Lisp. You see, Emacs is probably one of the greatest inventions known to man. Go ahead, tell me that I'm wrong. There's nothing that's gonna convince me otherwise, purely because of the fact that Emacs is just the most extensible tool and you can really mold it to work however you would like to do your day-to-day -day work. It's a really powerful and a amazing experience to work with. It's one of the things that's made me really fall in love with Lisp, but it's not really limited to that. Emacs is really, really simple once you get down to it. It's just learning the very basics that can be really difficult because not a lot of people have experience with Lisp. Now I could make a whole video showing it off and showing all these really cool things that you can do and there's lots of those out there. This video is really going to show you guys how you yourselves can start extending it um, and how you can look at Emacs Lisp and understand what you're looking at and understand how to read it. And so in this video I'm going to try and get you guys over the hurdle of learning the very introductory stuff and then once you're through this video you guys will know enough to basically look at Emacs code and kind of start to understand what's going on. So this is purely focused on the language less so the editor, um, just to try and make the video short and get you guys introduced and understand what's going on. Anyways guys, without any more delays, let's go ahead and get into the video. So like I said before, Emacs is once again one of man's greatest achievements. And in this video, I kind of wanted to get you guys introduced to Emacs Lisp, the language it uses. Because once you are comfortable with it, you get access to a very lightweight graphical environment. You get access to the best note-taking tool out there known as org mode. You've probably heard of it before if you're watching this video. Um, and a powerful configuration language, which is what we'll be looking at today. Now, really quickly, um, I'm going to go ahead and go through uh, a quick overview of Emacs. I'm not going to go too deep. If you guys are already somewhat familiar, then you can probably skip this. And if you ever need to, you can come back to it. I will have timestamps below so you guys can go ahead and jump ahead to the actual uh, introduction to Emacs Lisp. Now, the first thing you'll probably want to do is evaluate some Emacs Lisp. So to do that, we'll just make a little code block here. Don't worry, when you guys are normally navigating a Lisp file, you don't need to make these. So let's do a message. So this is kind of like a print statement, basically. And we'll do hello, right? And so to evaluate it, as I've listed right here, you can go ahead and do a control X, control E, and you'll see right down here, I have the words hello let up. Now, if you guys are looking for more of a REPL experience, as I've listed down here, you can do ILM, and this will give you a REPL-like interface, um, so you can do message hello, and then go to the end and hit enter, and it will print hello down here, and it will even give you the little, ev what it evaluates to, which is quite helpful. Now for this video, we won't really uh, worry about that, and that should be kind of a good starting point. Now, most of the e-list that you'll write will be in a file called under your home directory. In the .emacs.d directory, you would have an init.el. So now if I just go to that file, um, you'll see that I have quite a lot of code in mine, and you guys probably will eventually as well, uh, because it's very fun to configure, and you'll always be finding new little tricks and hacks to program a bit faster or solve a problem that you're sick of constantly writing up. The next thing you'll probably want to know is how to actually look things up, and it all is prefixed by this Control H uh, prefix. So if I type Control H, it will wait for me to type another key, and so if I hit uh, V, it will prompt me to type in the name of a variable. So if I kind of know what I'm looking for, so maybe I'm looking for key, and it will kind of give me completions. Obviously by default, Emacs won't give you all this. There's a lot of different ways you guys could set this up, but that's not really gonna be the focus of this video. This is just how you guys can look things up. And for example, for keys, when I hit Control X, and uh, it'll kind of wait for me to type another thing, I can hit Control H, and that will give me a bunch of information on the prefix and what buttons are available. So I did uh, Control X, Control, Control X, R, and Control H, it will prompt me with a bunch of information. Um, mine actually treats it like a command prompt, but uh, by default, it will just give you a little interface listing off all the possible keys. Now, like I listed down here, the two most important ones is how to look up a variable, which you can do Control H, V, and then we could do, um, I don't know, nil or something like that. And we can get pretty much no information actually for nil or control H F for org mode. And then that will give us a bunch of information on org mode. And the really awesome thing about it is that when we want to learn about these functions and how they work, right here we even have a link to the actual file. So you can actually jump to the elist file, which is pretty cool. And yeah, you guys can move around with the mouse as well too. So. Don't worry about that too much. 
Now I'll actually make a link down in the description that will give you guys access to a website that basically uh, will generate a configuration for you. I don't really like the idea of that, but also at the same time, I understand that the hurdle at the very start might be a bit much, so that might be enough to kind of get you started and you can use that code for reference later. Now for those of you guys that skipped ahead, nice to have you back. Uh, <laughs> Now we'll go ahead and move on to actually learning ELISP. So the first thing is the disclaimer. I'm basically going to say that I will not be covering everything um, that there is to Emacs. I won't be covering into the deep, uh, like the features of it. It's mostly going to be focusing on the language itself. So don't expect to know everything about Emacs at the end of this video. This is just going to be enough that when you see like a special symbol or something like that, you'll kind of know what's going on. And if you don't, you'll be able to look at the name of the thing and uh, Google it or something like that and find out the definition and what's going on with it and what it's doing. Because some things aren't very easy to Google. Like words are easy to Google, symbols aren't. So that's kind of the point of this video. And for reference, I will be comparing Elisp to Python, but really if you guys are familiar with any other language, that shouldn't really matter and you should be able to catch on uh, relatively quickly. The first thing that you're probably gonna wanna know and something that coming from Lisps you'll probably actually recognize is that nearly everything in Lisp is a function. Now that's not 100% true some things aren't functions but basically everything is treated like a function so for example adding adding is done with a function it's not like a procedure or anything like that and so everything has a return value now the first thing i want to explain to you guys is defining a variable now please don't at me i know that this isn't the only way to define a variable this is just the most general purpose and the one that you'll see people using quite a lot in uh, their own configs but in addition there are a lot of other things that exist out there like def custom and plenty of other ones that you'll want to know about but this is the bare minimum that you need to know and that's what i'm focusing on so just like in python uh, you can define a variable in a very similar way you use a set queue instead of equals um, which is a little strange but it kind of fits with what i was saying before with everything kind of being a function now this is probably a little confusing for those of you guys that aren't used to lisps but basically the equivalent that you'll see in most other languages is you would call a function like this and with lisp you call a function like this um, that's basically all there is to it. You basically put the function at the start of the parentheses. Might seem a little strange, but once you actually see the power that comes with it, uh, it's really understandable why it functions this way. Now, while we have set queue for setting a variable, we also have defun for defining a function or defun. I'm not really too sure how people pronounce it. DE for define a function. Uh, pretty straightforward. You will see that the Python equivalent is actually very similar. We do def the function name, the arguments as a list, print, and then the argument to print. Now the equivalent here would be using defun, arguments are a list, very similar. And then we do the function call uh, just like this for those of you guys that aren't very familiar with lisps. Uh, this is probably a little strange. All this means right here is that um, we've defined a function, here's its name, here's its arguments, and then we are calling a function called print with the argument of 10. Um, so if you guys are used to other languages, uh, most of the function calls would probably look like this, but in lisp they look like that. While it may seem a little strange, the idea of putting the function name at the start of the parentheses is actually really powerful. It even makes things like evaluating an expression really easy because now we can just do control X, control E, and we get the result, which here is 10. Now we can go ahead and evaluate this to define the function and we can call it with func name. We will just give it the argument of zero because the argument isn't actually being used anywhere. If we wanted to use it here, we could do, and then evaluate that and make it 10, nine, Control X, Control E, and you see down here it is printing 9. Now, while we have the basic functions that we use for programming, sometimes we want to make them available for the user to call, um, kind of like a command. And so we have the um, Alt X, which will basically give you this little, um, not quite the exact same interface, but a somewhat similar interface where you can type in a command to run. And so to define something closer to a command, all you do is you add this interactive um, right here. And then if I evaluate that and hit Alt X, I now have func name right here. Um, so if I did func name and hit enter, expect some more arguments, one sec. Let's just change this to, uh, let's do optional. There you go. And really the only reason the optional is needed is just to say like this argument is optional because we aren't really calling it with an argument. Um, so there you go. And so by default, it's using 10 because um, we didn't actually use the argument in this version. Now, something I wanted to go back to was the similarity between the Python version right here and the Lisp version. So the big thing is that with Lisp, um, you actually can just uh, highlight the whole thing 
So when you highlight the whole thing and do Control Alt, um, right, oh, one sec, Control Alt Vertical Bar or backslash, I guess it says here, um, it will actually align everything for you. And so you kind of get a similar uh, look to what you will get with Python. And that's kind of the way you guys can look at it. It's just using the indentation to understand what's going on a bit more than actually understanding the individual parentheses. And so that's kind of what I would recommend for understanding what's going on in the Lisp code is kind of reading it similar to how you'd read Python code. Now, as we alluded to before, you can call a function by just wrapping it in parentheses. And basically this is the Python equivalent. Now, like I said before, even addition is done with uh, as a function. So it is treated just like a normal function call. Um, so the equivalent here would have been a plus 10 and one. Um, note though that we actually don't use a comma in Lisp, we just separate them by spaces. Um, I find this to be a bit better and a bit less vague on uh, the order of things and it means less things to mess up. Now, as you guys can see down here, it evaluates to 11. Now on to some of the more interesting stuff like what primitives and different language features we have. So the first one is a list. Now a Python list, like most others, is done kind of similar to how an array might look in C. And then the equivalent in Lisp is a quote before the parentheses, which as you guys may have noticed is very similar to what a function call looks like. And this will make a bit more sense in just a second. Now, if I were to evaluate this, you would see right down here, we get a list. And right here, we also get a list. And as I mentioned right here, lists are the most common data structure you will see in Lisp. So expect to see quite a lot of uh, parentheses because <laughs> they're also used for function calls and everything's a function call mostly. Now we get into some of the more confusing parts of Lisp. Um, so I totally understand if this starts to slow you down a bit, I'm going to try and go over this really slowly so it makes sense. So while we have uh, lists, we often need a way to pull values out of a list, um, like get the first value, get the second value, etc, etc, etc. And so the way that this is done in Lisps is using a function called car. Um, it's a little confusing, but once you've used it a few times, it just kind of sticks with you and you remember it. Um, car is just like a you know like a vehicle i guess um the history behind it's a little strange but basically if you evaluate this you'll see right down here we print a one and i have the result if we um, evaluated it so it will basically grab the first value out of a list to grab the rest of the values from a list you use cutter now you're probably thinking like why cutter uh well it's basically a historical thing um if you guys want you can google it it's pretty interesting but it really is just kind of something people decided on and it kind of just stuck um, so the way you can remember it is that A comes before D. So if you want the first value, you'd use car. And if you want to use get the rest of the values, you would use cutter. And uh, just for reference, if we were to evaluate this, you would see that we get uh, 2, 3 in 1, 2, 3. And like I have here, you'd get 2, 3. Now, just a really quick review to make a list. We would do 1, 2, 3, 4. And if we evaluate that, we get a list. And if we wanted to get the first value, We'd surround that in parentheses and we would do car and evaluate that we get one and if we changed the a to a d for cutter and evaluated that we get two three four now once again i know this is strange but trust me it all starts to make sense in a bit and if it doesn't make sense just play with it a bit you'll understand very quickly for some reason uh obs decided to just straight up die on me crank up my cpu to 100 so um not really too sure what happened there but anyways we'll get back to the topic at hand so the big thing i wanted to talk about next is these lists that i've been showing you guys these uh quotes with a parentheses one two three these lists can actually contain anything so if i evaluate this uh, you'll see the result is up here just made that to make it a bit easier for you guys to read and if i go down to here you'll see that we can pull the values out um just like we were doing a second ago. Now, what if we did something like that, but used an expression? Because they look so similar together. You could do the one, two, plus one, two, three. And if we evaluate that, we'll see that that evaluates to three. But if we put a quote before it, kind of like a list, what do we get? Well, we get a list of plus one, two, and three. So a little strange, but this is kind of something um, that's actually what makes uh, Lisp very powerful. And we'll see later how this can be used by the user to do a lot of really interesting things. Now, just like before, we can evaluate this and we will actually get back a plus. Pretty interesting, hey? And so 
this plus that we're getting back here is what is known as a symbol. And a symbol is basically kind of like an element or basically something that hasn't been evaluated yet. A symbol can really be anything. And so one and two are actually symbols. They just evaluate to themselves. But plus, what does plus evaluate to? Well, if I was to uh, evaluate plus, that's what I'm doing down there, uh, we get an error because there is no Ver there is no variable associated with plus, but obviously there's variables and values associated with one and two, the numbers one and two. What I was referring to before as a list is not exactly a list. What we're doing is we're actually taking an expression and the quote is saying, do not evaluate this. That is basically what quote does is it says, don't evaluate this. So if we go here and I evaluate this quote plus, you'll see just like before we get a plus. And if I remove the quote and I evaluate it, I get an error saying blah, blah, blah symbol with value variable void plus basically saying that there is no variable associated with plus now hopefully this is kind of starting to make sense if we wanted to make a list and have something be evaluated what would we use well we'd use the list function so if we have this here and we evaluate this and this we will get a list of 10 1 2 3 kind of like what we'd expect in other languages now if we were to evaluate it with a quote instead of using the list function we would get a list of name 1 2 3 basically like what we were seeing before. For those of you guys a little confused with this, this is just a feature of org mode. So it's just evaluating to a list. Hopefully that makes sense. Now you're probably wondering, Gavin, why did you not tell us about the list function at the start? Well, that would have just not made for a very good plot twist um, and wouldn't have quite been quite as interesting uh, as what I wanted to talk about, which is the quoting. Quoting is a very important part of Lisp. In fact, when we are doing this set queue, we're actually, uh, this is like a shorthand. Set queue is equivalent to saying set and then quoting a value or a quoting a symbol, I guess, and then a value. So if we did this, we are actually doing the exact same thing. We are setting, we are what's called binding uh, the symbol name to the value of 10, um, which is a very interesting thing. And as a result, if we evaluate this, we will get 10. Um, and that is the exact same thing. So if we change this to uh, nine, so we could evaluate this, um, which as we know, evaluates to 10. And here we get a nine. And then if we evaluate again, we'll see that we get a nine again, because we have set the value. Now this is a little strange, but it is actually very powerful. And the big thing here that I wanted you guys to kind of take away is how quote works. Now, in addition to normal quoting, you sometimes want to be able to quote some things and actually evaluate some things. And this is when you use something called quasi quoting. Quasi quoting is basically a backtick. Uh, I think it's also known as a grave on lots of keyboards. This grave right here allows us to do something called unquoting. So while normally, if we just did a, a normal quote and remove this, evaluate it, we would get one, two, name, and our age. Now, if we were to go ahead and undo all of that, and let's just delete these results, and we evaluate it, you'll see that we get one, two, Gavin, and age. That is because we have basically this unquote says, take the next symbol and just uh, evaluate it before the quoting happens, okay? So kind of like I said before, it's an unquoting. Um, so kind of like how you, if this was like a string um, in most languages, you would do a backslash uh, name kind of to, or something like that, um, backslash n or something like that to escape it. Um, and that's a very similar thing to what we're doing here. We're basically escaping the next value. Okay, and now we're getting into the final, final reaching point, final point of understanding how the lists work and how Lisp works and kind of what's going on here is the con cell. Con cells are the building blocks of Lisp. And so all you need to do to create a con cell is use the cons function. Now, basically, if we evaluated this, we would get a one, a dot, and a two. Now, a con cell is basically um, like an element in a list. And we take these con cells and we chain them together, kind of like the chains of a fence. We link, link them up. I don't have enough hands to show you all the links, but we link all these uh, together. And at the very end, we give them an empty list, um, which is represented by nil. Um, this is the exact same thing as if we gave it, uh, so if we gave this and evaluated it, we would get a list of one and two. And the same thing happens if we use nil. Um, you'll see nil used quite a lot, um, but nil is basically just an empty list. And so we basically are chaining these together to create a list. And that's kind of why we have these other options for a bit of a faster um, way to do it. All right, so really quick review. Uh, so we have a basic list, which we can do with list one, two, th and then we can evaluate that. We get a list and we get the exact same thing from uh, a quote beforehand, just deleting the results. 
evaluate that, we get a list as well. Um, we can get the first value out of a list um, by using car and get the rest of them with cutter. That's pretty much all we would need. And then we can also use cons to get a pair basically. And then we can use these pairs um, to make a list. So pretty, pretty explanatory, uh, pretty simple. And once you guys have worked with it for a bit, this starts to just become common sense, especially if you guys are familiar with the idea of a linked list. Um, and like before, if we did a nil here, we would get a list of one. And then like before, uh, the equivalent to nil is just an empty list, which evaluates theoretically to nothing. Now, something that often confuses people about Emacs is how functions work. You see, uh, Emacs Lisp is what's kind of considered a functional language, even though it's not really a functional language. Um, but it has a lot of functional properties and a lot of things that inspire um, functional languages to this day. And so the big thing is how you use functions and you can actually kind of call upon them and you use functions quite a lot. And so something that you see in a lot of functional languages is the ability to set a, treat a function just like a value. Now with Emacs, this works a little differently than you would expect. So you know how before we were using uh, def, def fun, no arguments, and then that returns 10 or I don't know, let's do 20 because I've used 10 a lot. How many do we evaluate that? And then if we wanted to run it, uh, just and we evaluate it, we get 20. A lot of people from functional languages would be, why wouldn't I just use set queue? Because you were telling me before that set queue is how I set it. And so um, something that you see in a lot of functional languages is an ability to declare a function that doesn't have a name, so you can assign it to a variable. And this is what's known as a lambda. Now, what we could do is we could do uh, lambda, it's 10. And so what we're seeing here is we are calling a function without a name that returns 10. Um, so without the function call, we would just get this. And with the function call, we actually uh, evaluate it. And so what a lot of people would think to do is we'd think to use uh, set queue, is we would do set queue, z, 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 let's do with. We would usually get an error. And so the error uh, right down here, prog n simple function uh, definition is void for a, or in this case, it would be Z. Um, my Emacs is a little messed up right now. Uh, I think it has to do with the OBS crash that I was just talking about earlier. Um, let's not worry about that. But anyways, uh, so usually you'd get an error. Now you're probably thinking, okay, but like this exists, I should be able to call this somehow, right? Like if I wanted to say, for example, you know, there's a lot of times where you want to basically pass a uh, function as a value. And so the way that you would do this is a little different from what you'd see in most languages. Um, and so here we're doing a very similar thing to what we were doing before. And here's where I was saying before you would get an error. And the next thing that you'd want to do is you'd want to move on to trying to sort of treat these things the same way. So when we define a as this value and as a function, uh, and we try and call it, we will get the value. And when we try and call it again, we will get the function. So here we are defining a in two ways. We're defining it as a variable and we are defining it as a function. And so what this allows us to do is we can treat a as both a value and a function, but they're two separate things. You see, like this, the value of 10 that we set it to with set queue and the value of hello world. So something's going wrong here. This it's treating being treated very different from when we use it as a function call. And so the reason that it kind of feels like uh, set queue isn't working the same way as we'd expect is because uh, functions and variables have what's known as a different namespace. Now what that means is that we can set a as a value and as a function, right? So let's evaluate that, we get a. So if we go to this code block down here, it is using it as a value. It is not surrounding it in parentheses, trying to treat it as a function call. So if we evaluate it, we will get 10. But if we tried to evaluate it as a function, well, we would it would be getting 10 or something like that, right? Well, instead, it will actually call it as a function. All right, so just going back up to here, as a function, it would print hello world, and as a variable, it would give us 10. So how can we differentiate this? Well, that is what the hash quote is used for. So when we evaluate this, we'll see that we just get an A like before. Now, what is this A? Well, this A is kind of similar to what we were talking about with a symbol, but we are basically saying that this is a symbol that exists in the quote unquote function namespace. Oh, you can see my fingers. Function, function namespace. There we go. <laughs> uh, and so basically, 
this a here is actually a function. It's not just a generic symbol. We are saying treat this as a function, which really will just give us an a. Now, if we wanted to actually use it, we would use a fun call, right? So if we did um, this guy, we did fun call and we evaluate it, we would get hello world. Now, if we remove that hash quote and run it, we would usually get an error, but like I said before, my Emacs is being a bit weird, um, but it wouldn't work. We'd usually get an error. Now, if we did set Q, A is a lambda, um, takes no arguments, and it gives us 10. Now, if we evaluate this, we actually get 10. And if we do hash quote here, we get hello world. And so basically this hash quote is differentiating some value, like a variable, from uh, a function. So the variables can actually contain functions is basically what I'm saying here. So if you defined everything with set Q, you theoretically could use, uh, use them just like this. It would be kind of strange and you wouldn't be able to call them properly. You'd have to use fun call all the time, but uh, that's kind of how it works. And so when is this useful? Is probably what you're wondering. Well, the simplest use case is map car. If you guys are used to map in other languages, it will basically, um, oops, a little bit of a spoiler there. Uh, it will basically apply a function to every single argument. And so there's actually a function called one plus. So if we just uh, go ahead and make a new Emacs list block and we evaluate one plus one and we evaluate that we get two. And so we can actually call this function on every single argument. So we were basically saying uh, map car, so apply this function to every single element in a list, and it will give us a list that every single element has been added, uh, incremented by one, basically. And so this is actually the exact same thing as if we did lambda, and we take x, and we do plus one x. Um, and that is the exact same thing. And so if we did set Q, X, uh, actually let's do, I don't know, Q, and Q here, and evaluate it, we get, we get the exact same thing, all right? And if we did the hash quote, it's not going to work because it's going to be trying to reach out to a function that doesn't exist. So that's pretty interesting, um, and like I said before, we could do like a def fun, and we can define it as a function, and then it will all work just as we would expect. And for those of you at home that are like, what, I'm, yes, there is a function called plus one, uh, or one plus, um, kind of funny. And just like I said before, we can call it just using a lambda or setting a value to it. Um, so pretty powerful, and hopefully this kind of explains a lot of the confusing parts. Um, let me know in the comments if you're a little confused. But basically, this is kind of the idea. You use hash quote to access something as a function, and without hash quote, you are accessing it as a variable. Very simple. So there's probably a fair amount of you guys who found this really interesting, and I hope that you guys were able to learn quite a lot from it. I tried to go pretty in depth, but I didn't want to go too deep into the actual um, way that Emacs works. I just kind of wanted to teach you guys an introduction to the parts that I found were difficult to understand. And once again, I really appreciate uh, all the help that I get from my supporters, especially after such a long hiatus. I know life's been really busy recently. I didn't want to start the video with that because I figure only the people that care enough to know what's going on in my life would watch the end. Um, so I apologize for the long hiatus. I hope to keep posting more, but my life's just been really, really busy. Um, so sorry about that. And so just before we cap off the video, I just wanted to give a big shout out to Tall Guy Jenks and Platinus, as well as my supporters on Patreon. I wanted to thank Alexander Artemenko, Jim Lawson, Mingus, Russell Willis, and Connor G. Uh, if you guys can't tell, I had to rehearse that a few times. I'm not very good at reading off names, so apologies if I mispronounced any of them. And feel free to let me know if I did. I'd really appreciate it so I can uh, make sure that I'm giving you guys the thanks you deserve. Anyways, guys, thanks for watching. I hope to see you in the next one, and hopefully I will see you very, very soon in my next video. Thanks, and goodbye.